ears. I want to put it towards uh, now, Father Dimitri Tobias's time, is around the time when they probably start our Lenten lectures here at St. Ignatius. And around every year, on the Wednesdays during Great Lent, we invite theologians, priests, clergy, laity, to come and speak to us on different topics uh, that relate to our Orthodox faith uh, during Great Lent. We are always extremely blessed because this person who's speaking to us tonight, for some reason, does love coming here. I don't know why, but uh, we always have some <laughs> we always have a minor tech difficulty once in a while, but it's on our end. But um, our esteemed uh, president and pseudo IT chair Matthew Stinkowitz always comes to the uh, comes to the uh, rescue. Um, more importantly, though, just thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, the introduction for Dr. Helen is very minimal because, as I said, she's a standard of our community. She has been here almost either every year or every other year to offer some type of lecture, some type of discussion. What's so humbling with Dr. Helen is that she is a world-renowned theologian. She is someone who speaks in enormous conferences uh, throughout the world on different topics of the Orthodox Christian faith. Uh, it is so blessed that we have her just to offer a little uh, nourishment for, to each and every one of us during this Lenten season. Uh, biasly, I know her very well. Her nephew, uh, Father Anastasius Teodoropoulos, is my cubado. Uh, we step on those events, so we even have family ties as well, too. Regardless, we welcome Dr. Helen. We wish her all the best, and we thank her for joining us and to edify us short. Let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. I only brought my phone up because I don't have a watch. I, I keep forgetting to put a watch on, so um, there's no clock here. So I might occasionally take a look at the phone just to see it, what time it is. Um, so I, I don't <laughs> torture you endlessly <laughs> with too much. Um, uh, how am I going to advance this? Just uh, no. Swipe. Swipe. Uh, Swipe. Like, uh, like, hold on, I'll try it out. Let me help you. It's like a big desk. Let's see, up or side? I'm not sure. Oh, side. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. Yep, All left right. and right. Okay. So, oh, Jesus Christ, and of God, and he was having a second. All right, it's a great joy to be here tonight. I actually do remember uh, speaking here when Father Tobias was just a lay assistant. So, I don't know how far back that goes, mm. but I was definitely here for that. Um, Tonight, I, I thought we would take a look, first week of Lent, we are beginning to say the prayer of St. Anthem, and it's one of those prayers that everybody says all the time, and so it's become a very embedded, almost a rote kind of prayer, and I have discovered with the prayers that we pray all the time, it's like, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, it just rattles off the tongue, but when you take a deep dive, into those prayers. A whole world, a whole treasury opens up. And so we're going to do our deep dive into the prayer of St. Ephraim today. But a little bit about who St. Ephraim is. Um, he's pretty unknown to most of the Orthodox who are part of the uh, Greek and Slavic traditions because he actually hails from the Syrian part of Christianity. Let me move over here. This is a swipe. Okay, so early Christian tradition, education, literature was not only in Greek and Latin, but it was in Syriac as well. The third international ancient language of the church. It's related uh, to Aramaic. It's a dialect of Aramaic. That was the language of Jesus. And it was a language that was spoken throughout Syria, Palestine, Mesopotamia, Persia, Armenia, Georgia, India, and even into Ethiopia. We know that there was a, a presence of Christianity in these regions very early in the area that we are looking at in particular um, with Odessa. Uh, Odessa is over. Here's Antioch. Odessa is over here. And in the cities, we'll look over here. So, oops, sorry, not too much. Just okay. All right, okay, I have to be careful with that. Um, uh, Edessa, there was a, a, an ancient tradition that the icon not made by hands, 
is related to King Agbar of Edessa, who had requested healing from Jesus, and Jesus had um, wiped his face and sent the uh, cloth to King Agbar, and this became the icon that is not written by hands because it was, in fact, imprinted by his, the Lord himself. And that is in this region, okay, of Edessa. So Ephraim, in fact, was one of the great fourth century church fathers. People, he, he's in the stellar uh, community of Basil the Great, Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nyssa, Athanasius the Great, and at the end of the fourth century, St. John Chrysostom. And he's right there with all of them. Absolutely renowned, beloved, and venerated East and West in the church, um, admired and read. But his writings were a little bit different. They're not quite what we are used to in terms of treatises and uh, declarations and letters. He wrote a lot of poetry. He wrote hymnography. He wrote these beautiful uh, uh, metered and rhyming verses which is, of course, even more difficult. He also lived during one of the most turbulent periods of church life. Now, the whole church was experiencing the turbulence of heresy, probably the greatest heresy that ever faced the church. That was the heresy of Arianism, which doubted that Jesus is really God. He put him really, really high, but doubted that he was really God. So there was this that was torturing the church, just breaking it up, and, and, and the church fathers that I mentioned labored to bring the church to the true understanding that Jesus is of the same substance as the Father, and uh, we have this unity to this day, and Ephraim was part of that. In his hymns and his songs, he put through this true theology of the church. But there was more going on for him. All of this region here, uh, during that fourth century, was attacked by Persia. And the Persians were not Christians at this point. And they sieged the city that he was born in. He was born in the cities in um, 306. And they besieged the cities multiple times. And it, one point finally in 363, um, the Byzantines lost control of the city and the Persian emperor came in or king came in and he allowed the Christians to live if they all left. Otherwise they would be slaughtered. So they all had, they were all sent into exile and he went to Edessa. So, this is a man who knew desolation, the horrors of warfare, starvation, um, uh, being a refugee, being in exile. Uh, he understood the human condition. And indeed, in his writings, you see a great sensitivity and um, a a care to guide people, to give them something meaningful to hold on to, uh, to understand their frailties and their needs. And one of the beautiful hymns for Christmas, for example, he writes, he talks about the mother of God and what she must have gone through, uh, the kinds of uh, terrible things she that may have been said to her, the, um, uh, how she would be berated or uh, endangered by the, the thoughts, the evil thoughts of other people. But beyond that also, her own wonder. And it, it's beautiful to see fourth century church father, right, write about the inner thoughts and, and feelings of the mother of God and help us to understand the miracle uh, and the wonder that she sees at the birth of her son. So, um, in his life, he was never ordained uh, as a priest, but we do know that he was ordained as a deacon. Um, did he live as a monk? Well, uh, here are some things about him. He is venerated as a saint by all Christians. 
Uh, he was recommend, uh, recognized by his Greek and Roman contemporaries, as I said, born in the cities. Um, he didn't become a monk exactly. Monasticism actually is just sort of growing up at that period of time. Uh, the fourth century is actually the great period when monasticism became uh, the kind of structured living that we see today. Prior to the fourth century, it was just sort of a free form. Some people would gather together within the city and sort of covenant or agree to live together in a, in a um, unstructured um, uh, life of commitment. And we believe that he belonged to one of those groups. However, we know that he was a deacon and that he actually died caring for people uh, during the plague that beset the city in 373 or maybe 375. So he lived out his servanthood to Christ and how he cared for people. So St. Ephraim was a great example for us um, to offer this prayer to us. There is some question about whether he specifically wrote the prayer, but um, uh, this gives us a little bit more about him. Uh, I should say he's the author of over a thousand writings. And we don't have all of them, but we have at least 500 of them. It's very prolific. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about St. Ephraim's hymns, and I told you about how they reflected the human condition, um, they also taught theology, they brought the great moral and theological teachings of our faith to the people in a way that's very accessible, um, and people would sing them. And he, we know that he wrote hymns for all female choirs, which is interesting for us to think about, because we don't really think that women were doing much, but indeed um, they were singing yeah. in the churches in his area. And I, this is actually a Coptic Orthodox uh, uh, choir at this point here. We didn't have an all female. Uh, Greek Orthodox choir to put up. Uh, so. Anyway, all right, so about the prayer, a little bit about the prayer. So we have a lot of literature that is under the name of a friend, and it's very hard to sort through exactly which is his authentically and which belongs to the tradition of, of his writing. Um, and Scholars go back and forth saying, well, maybe this is in the Ephraimite tradition, um, or maybe it's Ephraim himself. And honestly, it doesn't really matter, because if it is in his spirit, and it clearly echoes his way of thinking, um, that means that his disciples took from him his way of thinking, his, his way of uh, expressing, and um, has been able to offer this to us. It has traditionally been recognized as the prayer of St. Ephraim. So that's what we go with. If you read through it in different liturgical texts, you will find different versions. All right. Um, the version we have here sort of combines some of the Greek and some of the Slavonic. There are minor differences, and I'm going to go with this one today. All right. So if you're, if you're like, well, there's a word that's different in the one that I use. You might, in this particular one, we say spirit of slop, despondency. In the Greek version, that's not the Greek in the United States, but the Greek from Greece, um, the word is not, uh, the word is, um, it's like me uh, uh, meddlesomeness. It's like somebody who, uh, uh, what is a petty idea, somebody who goes around and causes trouble. But the word that was used in the Slavonic version is this word despondency, and when we bring it into English, that's been the preferred version. And there's other few little changes and variations. You know what? They're all good. But it, we shouldn't obsess, okay? We shouldn't obsess. Whichever version speaks to your heart, you pray it. Okay? Not obsess about it. But let's get into it. Okay, so one of the things that we see about this prayer, first and foremost, and, and I do want to say that, you know, it's called the Lenten prayer. It's, it's the prayer that is peppered throughout 
our services, and we do repeat it more than once a day, right? Uh, why is it such a helpful aid in our journey? And one of the first things about it is that it's a little prayer. It's not big and lots of words and um, trying to communicate a lot of things to God. The fact is that the church really prefers these smaller, uh, more targeted prayers that are something that we can uh, remember, but also that we don't get stuck on saying a lot of stuff. We are being transformed in the process of prayer. It really isn't about everything we have to tell God. It isn't about everything that we have to tell ourselves. It is about opening our hearts so that God can work in us. And when we keep it to short, a short, simple statement, we enable that power and presence of God to begin to seep into us. We don't get our mind and our thoughts too tangled up. Right? The second thing is that this prayer, we pray with our whole self. It's one of the few things that we physically offer ourselves as we offer the words of prayer, because it includes prostration. And that is an important component of this prayer. Um, it enables our whole body and our whole self to be engaged and to enter into this receiving and uh, dialoguing with God. So these are a couple of aspects about this particular prayer. And how do we start? How do we start? We begin by calling God Lord and Master of my life. We recognize that God created me. He's the author of my life. He's the one to whom it still belongs. I'm not in charge. I'm not the author. author. That's the message we get, of course, in the fallen world, this world around us, this world that is so, so dedicated to celebrating uh, ourselves, okay? Uh, the me, <coughs> the power of me, the beauty and the, and the glory of me, right? But <coughs> we can't even begin to pray we can't even begin the Lenten journey until we let go of me and put ourselves into the reign, the dominion, the, the lordship of God, who is the king, the lord, the master of my life, a master who doesn't control us, a master who loves us, who serves us, who guides us, who saves us. Well, we have the best master there is, the kind of master that we should learn, um, you know, as we rule ourselves and we rule all others to offer service and love. We can ask ourselves, is he the Lord and master of my whole life? Is it a Sunday thing? Is it every single day? Do I wake up? Or wake up and say, Lord and Master of my life. And that's where we begin with this prayer. <clears throat> you know, just a few days ago, we started with Clean Monday. And we, we had a clean slate. We, uh, through forgiveness vespers, uh, we put aside our grievances and our uh, <clears throat> pettiness and the sins that have burdened us. Um, we've begun to liberate ourselves from the darkness, but it's a matter of walking a path that helps us now, if we have a clean slate, what are we gonna write on it? How are we going to grow up into this perfect image of God, which is perfect manhood, perfect humanhood, is Jesus Christ. How are we gonna grow up into that? If we have some kind of a clean slate at the beginning of Lent, 
how are we going to fill these days? And so, we start the prayer to help us figure out how to do that. All right. I have a, a great uh, affiliation with the uh, problem of sloth. I'm very well acquainted with this particular one. Um, it's my, uh, my spirit guide, if you will. So I, I definitely um, identify with Homer there. But here's the problem with this particular sin or vice or frailty or passion. It, it's the very one that will prevent anything else from happening good in your spiritual life. It cuts you off from the, at the beginning, right? It's the one that uh, gets you to the place you never get stuck in. So you're just dry land, right? It's like this caked up dry land, nothing fruitful, nothing's growing up out of it. Because what you have here is this, I don't have to do it right now, I'll have to do it some other time. Um, it's not even an actual sin because you're not really doing something. It's the absence of doing. You don't even feel like it's a real sin. You know, I didn't do anything bad. I just haven't done anything good yet, but I will, right? And that's, it's a false hope. It makes you think you haven't ruined anything. But if you haven't started anything, it's still nothing. Okay? Whether you destroy it and it's nothing, or you, you don't build it, it's still nothing. So it offers a sort of false hope. Oh, there's always tomorrow. It keeps you comfortable in that false hope. And in that idea, I think of the lobster, right? In the pot, there's a, that, uh, a story, right? That you put a lobster in a pot of cold water, and then you turn the water on, and as the water gets hot, the lobster accommodates to the, it never actually realizes that it's boiling and it, it's dying because it's been so gradual. And this is, a, this is the problem with sloth. It actually is corrupting your life and you can't even see it. So it poisons the water at its source, it wastes our life, and it really needs to uh, be combated by simply doing. And when I say simply doing, little things, the littlest thing will get you started. And that's why the prayer is what you need. <laughs> Say the prayer to attack, and you start with the first thing you need to attack, and that is your sloth. And when you hear that, when you recognize that, you can wake up to your day, right? This is a day the Lord has made. This is the day to make a difference in my life. So that is how you get <laughs> started on sloth. <clears throat> The next one I'm going to speak to is despondency. Now, when you translate the Slavonic into the Greek word, it's actually not the Greek word depression. We're not talking about clinical depression. That's not on, we're not discussing that today. But we are talking about um, a feeling of, some people translate it as faint heartedness. I prefer to call it spiritual tedium. Uh, spiritual boredom or spiritual um, uh, emptiness, loss of meaning. You feel that you are making no progress and um, it's kind of an ennui or boredom that everything, all the goodness, all the sweetness, all the joy has been seeped out of the spiritual past. All you have left is the effort, and even that seems meaningless. This, the Desert Fathers in particular, but the, all of the Church Fathers who spoke about the spiritual life, find this to be, for them, was actually the most dangerous uh, of the passions or the sins. Because it's the one that begins to sit there like a little um, 
voicing your little flea in your ear, buzzing, 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 right? Saying, why are you doing this? What's the point? You're not getting anywhere. You're not good enough. Uh, you're failing at that. Or sometimes it turns into blaming. Everything around me is working to prevent me from getting anywhere in any of this. I don't see any point to it anymore. Uh, I'm a failure. Why should I even try? I get nothing out of it. Yeah, my career is empty. All right. And when you have this sense of emptiness, uh, they, it, it feels as if um, you've been abandoned. And you have this darkness begin to settle into your heart. And you begin to feel as if uh, even the people who loved you don't understand you, and it builds and builds. So this faint-heartedness or uh, this feeling of boredom can actually transfigure or change or mutate right, into some deeper, <coughs> deeper problems, anger, uh, despair, and uh, it needs to be uh, addressed. How can we do it? It's a feeling of being suffocated claustrophobic even, um, like everything is just meaningless and dark and empty, trapped at the bottom of the well, uh, locked in by your struggle. And the way to regain heart when you've lost heart is to remember that the heart needs to grow and in order to do that, it needs to love. And so the antidote to spiritual boredom, first of all, is, and I, I know I said love, but first let me say the first antidote to spiritual boredom is prayer. Because that's the first thing actually you want to stop doing. Like, it's just, it's just, I'm not getting anywhere, I'm not getting what I need, I'm gonna change up my prayer, I'm gonna shorten my prayer, I'm gonna skip my prayer, uh, that's exactly the thing you can't do. You never stop your spiritual efforts. Okay, number one. And this is attested to by many of the saints. Keep at it. Just keep moving through, right? But then, to grow your heart, when your heart has felt, you know, like you've lost it. You've lost your heart. You've lost your heart for all of this. To grow your heart, do something to care for somebody else. Stop focusing all about yourself and the feelings you're getting and what kind of meaning you find. But do something of kindness, something that reaches out. And if you grow in that heart a little bit, you regain your own heart for the spiritual journey. So don't give up your hard work. Um, your spiritual past, your work of prayer, um, but now also look outside yourself to reach towards others. And now we're going to get to another way we reach out to others, but in a very <laughs> destructive way, um, because we have a great uh, propensity as human beings to want to take charge, to want to be in control. I think fundamentally, every human being has a deep-seated fear of vulnerability. Um, we call it basically, you know, we're all driven by the fear of death. We're all driven by the fear that something will enter into our lives to upset it and ultimately to end it. And part of addressing that is, well, I'm going to gain power, we gain control, and to be so invulnerable that nothing will assail me. I will live forever. I will build my towers. I will rule the world, right? And, uh, you know, at the bottom of that is fear. <coughs> not faith, not trust in God, right? It's fear. And uh, it's part of the human condition, but it moves in the fallen world, okay? In the fallen human condition, quickly. But um, it's not just about protecting me. The problem with, great problem with this ambition, this lust for power, this desire to control everything, <coughs> is that it inevitably 
attacks and devours other people. Right? So it, it destroys relationships. Um, this is the problem of making me the center of life and, and the world as opposed to caring about those around us and moving out of our self-glorification uh, self and our, our uh, putting ourselves first. And so we have to ask ourselves, uh, how am I treating the people around me? We begin to address this vice, this sin, by looking at our family first. Look at the people at church. Look at the, the work that you what you do at your work world. Is it always about me being right? Me being in charge? Can I listen to others? Take the time to sit there and, and, and look at the human beings around you and find ways to reconcile and let go. Let go of being always right and always in control. So we ask for this. Well, um, in uh, you know, take for me this spirit, this spirit. Um, then we have vain and idle talk. All right. So, yes, it includes gossip, and it seems, yeah, we just went from, you know, <laughs> ambition and, you know, so the very clear <coughs> destructive vice of ambition and power taking charge and all that, and you hurt people's feelings. Now we come to something that seems so little, so unimportant, talking about each other, just words, right? But words destroy lives. And um, this is not just something the woke generation has come to observe. Um, the church fathers talk about this too. That's why they're very, well, what scripture talks about it. Every word matters. Your words give life, or your words can destroy. Your words matter. You can crush, or you can uplift a person. Um, and another thing about idle words, not just that they can cause so much harm, but they're a waste of your life and your breath. You have only so many words to offer in this life and only so many breaths to offer. And if you're gonna spend your time on stupid, idle, nasty, mean, no, you, me, we all spend so much time there. We're wasting our own lives. And I have a quote from um, a priest who, I have a couple of quotes from him, who lived in the Soviet era, suffered a great deal, Father Alexander Men, but, he did a reflection on the prayer of St. Ephraim, and he comes to this part, and he says, I have, I exempt children. They have the right to chatter, but only until the age of 15 or 16, he says. When children chatter, they are learning to communicate and are practicing their language. But when these children are already 20 or older than 40, this means they are being pitiless towards their own lives. Not just the people they're talking about. We're being, pity, we're being pitiless to our own lives. How much longer do we have to live, he says. Not much longer at all. Therefore, I repeat, we should value life and love the gift that God has given us, remembering that we will carry into eternity only that which we have in our hearts. Idle talk and blathering are frightful words, for they involve killing time. That's a perspective I hadn't had before. It was very eye-opening. And it brought to mind a statement from one of the Desert Fathers who said, Abba the Macarius the Great said to his brothers at Sketis, when he dismissed the assembly, he said, flee my brothers. Well, one of the old men asked him, where could we flee beyond the desert? I mean, they, the, the whole point of going to the desert is that they fled the city. They fled the, you know, the, the social institution and the conflict. Now they're in the desert. Where are they going to go? He put his finger on his lips and said, flee that. Right? Flee that. And he went into the cell, shut the door, and sat down. <coughs> so we flee that. All right. But, okay, 
so from first for from asking God's help in battling these four areas in which sin destroys us in silent and subtle ways uh, in our ordinary lives, now Ephraim brings us to the point of look having us uh, ask for four elements fundamental to the transfigured life. All right. But grant unto me your servant. And the first one is, um, it's a little hard to translate. That's why I put it here in the Greek, the Sophrosini. It has a lot of different sort of cognates to it. Um, we often translate it as chastity, but chastity is all we, you know, everyone thinks about sexual continence. I actually almost put continence up there, but when I when you Google continence for photographs, it's all about adult diapers. So that doesn't work. <laughs> um, what it really refers to is the, uh, a kind of wisdom and discernment that's very practical, that involves um, self-discipline, self-control wholeness of the self by guiding yourself in the proper ways, by holding the passions together. In fact, it's it's uh, really a sense of balance in your life. And so I, I put in the girl looking at the cookie jar because the idea is that you build discipline, right, through recognizing that there are many goods in this world, there's many blessings and, and beautiful things, but um, our Passions, our desires, our, our uh, needs uh, shouldn't just be firing off on everything and going in every which way in every direction. We need to keep them under control. We need to guide them, and we need to redirect them. Redirect them. In a way, Sofrosini is about redirecting all of your desires so that they harmonize with God's will. Because this is the one thing that will answer our deepest heart's desire. That is to be with God, to live the divine life, to, to share um, in the glory of, of the heavenly kingdom with one another and with, with God. So the deepest desire is the one that actually should be the governing factor with all of the other desires. And so we... We hold off on the cookies for a while <laughs> um, and all of the other things because we have something greater in mind. And um, so this is how we do this, step by step, little things, uh, partly the fast, but also all the other things that we sort of build into our life of self-discipline. The next one is humility. <laughs> humility. And um, this is one that that is so foreign to modern people in our world today. Yeah. We, we are very quick to disdain humility in our life today. We see it as a weakness. But I wanted to put these pictures up for you to show you how strong humility makes you. Because there's the old saying, the deeper you go, the higher you go. And in fact, you know, we have this image of the, the tree that grows very tall, has very deep roots, and when you build a building, did I just change it? I did. Okay. When you build a building, I'm not an architect, and I know in general the rule, I mean, I know they have new structural tools, etc. today, but in general, the idea is the taller you go, the deeper your foundation. And that's really the idea of humility here, that, um, as we empty ourselves of ourselves, and that's what humility does, it, it takes the me out of you and you begin to, to uh, leave room now for God. Um, he fills you up. And what is greater and stronger than being filled with the Lord? Uh, so it's when we are weak and frail and dependent and need one another and need God that we find our strength and we grow in perfection. The perfection of humility, we know, is mirrored and imaged in Christ, who gave us 
the, the, the perfection of humility to which we aspire. Uh, we have the icon of extreme humility, where we see how in love Christ empties himself of his glory, of his divine glory, in order to offer himself fully for our salvation, for our uh, restoration and reconciliation. And he is the image of how our humility is supposed to, to follow, the pattern for our humility. Um, and what that accomplishes ultimately is the reconciliation of us with God, but it's a reconciliation of, of the whole world. So humility is the path of strength and triumph and glory. And patience, patience. Again, we have to distinguish patience from weakness. Patience, the ability to achieve your goals when you have all of the obstacles um, that obstruct you, that um, you think it's impossible to get there. I love this image of the water piercing through stone, through endless years of dripping, because a stone wall looks impenetrable. You'll never get through there. You'll never build a path through there. But that water dripping every single day endlessly carves, etches that path right through. And this is the patience that enables us to uh, encounter the most extreme obstacles and find our way to God. Again, I'm going to quote Father Alexander Mend, who, again, Soviet of Russia, <laughs> lived a great peril to himself, ultimately was uh, murdered, literally murdered, uh, on his way to church. Uh, he was, he was um, attacked. Uh, some say he was martyred for his work. Baptized hundreds, maybe thousands of people into the Orthodox faith. faith. So he knew a lot about patience. Right? He says, patience is not the state of cattle, which tolerate everything. It's not humiliation. Not at all. It's not a compromise with evil under no circumstances. So we don't want to think of patience as like, okay, do whatever you want. I'm just going to sit here and wait. That's not it. Patience, he said, is the ability to maintain equanimity of spirit in circumstances that impede it. It's the ability to achieve one's goals when encountering various obstacles along the way. It's the ability to maintain a joyful spirit, even when there is an excess of grief. Patience is a victory in an overcoming, a form of pushed courage. And... Um, Let's remember that we not only have patience with each other, but you have to have patience with yourself. We become, one of the actual dangers in the spiritual journey of life is when you see your failures and you get so mad at it, that's a good thing, okay, you can get mad at it, but you get so mad at it that you give up. Or you, you descend into a place of darkness instead of a place of hope. And Clinicus has, St. John Clinicus has a antidote to that. He says, do not be surprised that you fall every day. Do not give up, but stand your ground courageously. <coughs> and assuredly, the angel who guards you will honor your patience, will honor your patience. So we have angel guides that will help us get up <coughs> and try again. So patience with each other, patience with yourself in the spiritual journey. Um, there is no obstacle with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that water, by the way, is very reminiscent of the power of the Holy Spirit because the Spirit comes to us in water, wind, fire, sound, but certainly also you know, in water. Um, that power of the Holy Spirit will penetrate every obstacle. And the last of the list, love. 
and the greatest. It's the greatest of all the virtues. It's pretty much every spiritual writer concludes with love. They get there. You have to get there. I was asked once with all of the, the mystics that I've read and all the uh, ascetic spiritual writers, etc., that I've read, all the church fathers, what, how would you summarize everything? I'm like, well, that's, that's a ridiculous task, but let me tell you, it isn't as hard as you think it is. Because it's so, it's almost trite to say it. But all of them, it's always about love. That's it. That's where they land. That the, the, the road is on that road, and that's where you're going, and it's the, it's the way. All the way along those the road is what. Um, and so it is looking at each person that we see the face of Christ. And it is in seeing the face of Christ that we offer love. Um, and we know who God is because he loved us first in Christ. And his love is reciprocal, returning to us what is what we give to him. And it is this offering and receiving. And what I wanted to highlight with this image of love, to make it practical for us, is something that St. Um, Dorothea of Gaza talks about. He talks about the wheel of love. So I, that's why I have a wheel here. It, People like putting their arms around each other. Okay, and essentially he says, I have another slide which will show this even more. He says, the closer we come, if, think about, here, let's go to the next slide. Okay. Think about the world as a wheel, and the center of the world is God. And the life of each of us is one of the spokes along the wheel. And we are moving each of us, towards God. Find the center of our life, to find the center of the world, <clears throat> we are moving towards God. And all of our brothers and sisters are along the, the wheel too. <clears throat> but look what happens. As we get closer to the center, and everybody's moving closer, if everybody moves closer to God, the distance between us as you move closer to God, look how far it is here when you're far away from God. Look at as you've gotten close to God, how close you are to each other. And he says, similarly, if you love each other, if you tighten, you tighten the distance between you and your neighbor, you bring the whole circle tighter and tighter closer to God. So the more you love God, the closer you are to your neighbor. The more you love your neighbor, the closer you are to God. And the opposite is true, too. The more you hate your neighbor, the further you will fall from God. And the further you fall from God, the more your relationship with your neighbor. And it's a brilliant way to talk about love, but it's very concrete. You can say, you know what? I want to love God. Let me love the guy right next to me. You know, let me show him kindness and mercy. And then we'll all both start going closer to God. And now we have the concluding part of the prayer where he says, Grant that I may not see my own, <coughs> grant that I may see my own flaws and not judge others. Not judge others. So Again, Ephraim is from the 4th century, uh, so it's a, there's a lot of literature at that time that talks about the importance of not judging one another. But this just never gets old. It's always a big problem in our lives that we sit in judgment of one another. We look at each other, they're, they're not good enough, they're not smart enough, they're not... They, they're not kind enough to their children. They're too, they're too focused on material wealth. We have lots of ways of criticizing each other. And criticizing our children, criticizing our parents. But the reality is, to grow spiritually, we need to look at ourselves and not judge others. And there's this wonderful story from the desert. I wanted to, one of my favorite, it's in 
heard me speak before, I might have told it to you, so forgive me if you've heard it before. But, but it comes from the Desert Father, St. Moses, uh, uh, the Ethiopian, or sometimes he's called Moses the Black. Um, Moses was a very interesting character, this, this particular Moses. Uh, he literally was a murderer, a thief, and a murderer. He was a, he was a vicious, he was a vicious and violent person who became a Christian monk in the desert, completely transformed, um, and very venerated by his disciples. And the story goes, okay, here you have an image of a man with a big sack, <coughs> And stuff is, is draining out of the sack. The sack's got a hole in it. So if you're out, he's here and now it goes, okay. Um, uh, a brother in Sketis, and this is in the Egyptian desert, commits a fall. The council was called, to which Abba Moses, the preeminent elder of the, of the monastic community, is called. And he refused to go. But they're like, well, you have to come, right? Come, for everyone is waiting for you. So Abba Moses comes, but he gets a great big sack, a sack with a hole in it. And he fills it either with sand or with water. There's a couple of different versions. It's either it's a jug or a barrel with water or a sack of sand. He fills it, and it's leaking, and he's coming there. And their father, what's this? What are you doing? He says, well... My sins run out behind me, and I do not see them. But today I'm coming to judge the arrows of another. When they heard that, they said no more to the brother, but forgave him. Well, that's what we have to remember. <laughs> you know, we have big sacks of sins, and they're trailing out behind us, and we aren't looking at that. We're looking over there at our, at our neighbor, right? should turn around and take a look, see, see the mess we've made, and clean that up first. The prayer doesn't quite end there. There is, of course, uh, praise and blessing and thanksgiving to God as we end the prayer. We remember how gracious he is. We offer prostration. Uh, we end with hope and anticipation for uh, God's mercy coming close to us, and we end with a sense of quiet joy as we prostrate ourselves, um, knowing that we've learned something and we're ready to go forward. And I wanted to end with another quote from St. Ephraim, um, because I think it echoes what I said before <coughs> you, what all the church fathers, really what they're about. He says, my beloved brethren, let us not prefer anything. Let us not hasten to obtain anything more than love. Let no one have anything against anyone. Let no one repay evil for evil. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, but let us forgive our debtors everything. And let us welcome love, because love covers a multitude of sins. So thank you for letting me share this with you. Uh, before we dismiss, does anyone have any uh, questions or anything you want to? Uh... Good question. Uh, when the prayer was written, was it specifically for men? Was it not defined as it was? Yeah. Um, probably not specifically for men. Um, the idea of, well, they 